In this video, we'll check out the brand new Raspberry Pi 5. If you're new to Raspberry Pis in general, you may find this video especially helpful. We'll start by unboxing it, set it up with some of the official Raspberry Pi accessories, and show you everything you need to get up and running with PiOS Desktop from beginning to end. Instead of having to watch five or more videos, everything you need to get started is right here. And if you're already familiar with Raspberry Pis, you'll find chapter markers below that will allow you to skip over what you already know. I hope you find this video to be exactly what you're looking for and share it with all your friends and family that are also considering a Raspberry Pi. I'm John and welcome to Wagner's Tech Talk. On September 28th, 2023, the Raspberry Pi 5 was announced and I didn't hesitate to order one. The items you see here are what I would recommend at the present time if you plan on using your Pi 5 on your desk. For example, the Pi Active Cooler is highly recommended to keep your Pi from entering thermal throttling. That is, if the Pi gets too hot, it will slow down without proper cooling. Similarly, I'd recommend picking up the official 27 watt USB-C Pi 5 power supply. While the power supply for the Pi 4 may work to a point using only 18 watts, you may find some devices will need the extra wattage supplied by the Pi 5 power supply. While a case isn't required to use the Pi 5, it's also a good idea to pick one up to help protect it from accidental drops or damage. I'm sure there will be many other options in the future, but for now, the official Raspberry Pi 5 case is a decent start. However, I did find an issue with this case when being used with the active cooler, and we'll discuss that in a few moments. Like the Pi 4, the Pi 5 uses a micro HDMI port, so you'll need one or two micro HDMI to HDMI cables, depending on how many displays you plan to connect to the Pi. And last but not least is the Raspberry Pi 5 itself. The one I picked up was the 4 gigabyte model, but they go up to 8 gigabytes. There are a few more things that you'll need to pick up, but we'll discuss them once we set up what you've seen already. Now we'll discuss some of the main features of the Raspberry Pi 5. The Pi 5 has maintained its small credit card sized form factor. It still has gigabit ethernet, and the port has been moved to the left when compared to the Pi 4. It also has two USB 3.0 ports here in the middle, which each support simultaneous 5 gigabits per second operations. That basically means it can transfer more stuff faster and at the same time. On the far right are two USB 2.0 ports, which are ideal for connecting a keyboard and or a mouse. In terms of processing power, the CPU is a Broadcom BCM2712 64-bit ARM Cortex-A76 quad-core chip operating at 2.4 GHz. It also includes an integrated 800 MHz Video Core 7 GPU for improved graphics processing. In a nutshell, it means the brain of the device is 2 to 3 times faster than the prior Pi 4. There are also two MIPI DSi Display Ports slash CSI Camera Ports for connecting additional displays or cameras. Each port supports up to 1.5 gigabits per second and is backwards compatible with older cameras. That is, you can use these ports to add up to two additional displays or cameras with the appropriate ribbon cables. Like on the Pi 4, the Pi 5 also includes two micro HDMI ports for connecting two 4K displays. And the USB-C power cable plugs into the far left port. There is also a power button, which is a new addition, and the inclusion of a PCI Express port. This port will allow using a ribbon cable to connect what is called a hat to use it with M.2 devices and more that should arrive in 2024. I didn't mean to make that rhyme. The port has a maximum bandwidth of 500 megabytes per second. Even the micro SD slot on the back has been upgraded with high speed SDR 104 support. It also includes the familiar 40 pin GPIO port, which is very useful for creating your own custom electronics or robotics projects. It makes the Pi an excellent tool for educational use, tinkering, or serious projects. 
With this port, you can control LEDs, servos, motors, and just about any digital component. Some additional features include the RP1 dedicated I.O. or input-output chip, which offloads much of the I.O. from the CPU. It also has an onboard real-time clock and port to connect an optional button cell battery to keep it powered when the Pi is turned off. Next, we'll turn our attention to the hardware setup. Installing the active cooler to the Pi 5 is very easy, but let's go ahead and step through it. If you find a small cover over the fan connector, just remove it with some tweezers. Insert the fan connector into the port behind the USB 2.0 ports. Remove the protective backing over the thermal pads and position the cooler over the Pi, lining up the two holes with the spring supports. Then press in on each of the two supports to fully secure the cooler to the Pi 5. Now we'll install the Raspberry Pi case for the Pi 5. At the time of this recording, this was about the only case available, and it's just an okay option. On the bottom, it has ventilation and screw holes, though no screws are included. When you remove the top cover, you'll find it already has a fan installed. I can only assume it's here for those who haven't already purchased the Pi cooler. Inside the case is a small envelope which contains a heat sink and rubber feet. I'm puzzled why there is only one heat sink instead of several for more than just the CPU. Perhaps there is a reason for this that I just don't quite understand. The Pi cooler had thermal pads across three different chips. Since we're already using the fan connector with the Pi cooler, this fan isn't necessary, so I'll go ahead and remove it. I'll quickly apply the four rubber feet, and there we go. Inserting the Pi into the case was very easy after I realized you have to slightly raise up on one end and bring it in at an angle. Once you do that, it just snaps into place. But this is where things got a little weird. I didn't see any way to install the other half of the case with this clear plastic piece on. The plastic that was holding the fan interferes with the heat sink on the Pi cooler. So I had to completely remove this clear piece. At this point, I'm really only using a small part of the Pi 5 case. Well, anyway, from here, it snapped on just fine, and the cover did as well. You still have access to the ports you need, the SD card slot, and of course, the power button. Again, I think this case is just okay for now, but definitely looking forward to seeing more options in this area from third-party companies. Next, we'll need the power supply, which again is a USB-C port on the end that plugs into the Pi. And in case you're interested in the adapter output details, here's a close-up of the adapter. You will need a keyboard and mouse. This is the official Raspberry Pi keyboard and mouse. I like using it because the mouse plugs into the keyboard and the keyboard into the Pi and only takes up a single USB port on the Pi. However, any USB keyboard and mouse will work just fine. Next, we'll plug in the power. Take the micro HDMI cable and plug it into the HDMI port nearest the power port on the Pi and the other end to your display. The power LED on the Pi will show red. Press it once to turn it on and it'll turn green. At this point, you may be wondering why I'm holding the shift key on boot without a micro SD card. On the Pi 4, there was a beta network bootloader that supported the ability to write an image directly from the Pi to the micro SD card. Unfortunately, that feature isn't available for the Pi 5 at the current time. This means we'll need a separate computer, such as a PC, Mac, Raspberry Pi, etc., to flash the operating system to a micro SD card. The brand and capacity of the card is totally up to you, but I'll use this SanDisk Extreme Pro 64GB card for installing PiOS Desktop. You can use an adapter, such as this Beagle adapter, which has both USB Type-A and USB Type-C ports with a micro SD or SD card. Next, we'll insert this into our computer, and I'll show you how to image PiOS Desktop to the micro SD card. Next, we'll install PiOS Desktop to the Raspberry Pi 5. The software we'll use to write the PiOS Desktop image to our micro SD card is called Raspberry Pi Imager, and it's a free download. 
Simply open a browser on your computer and visit raspberrypi.com forward slash software. Scroll down a little ways and you'll find download links for the various operating systems such as Windows, Mac OS, Ubuntu x86, and for the Raspberry Pi itself. Select the link for your computer and simply follow the prompts to install Pi Imager to your computer. Now let's write the Pi OS desktop image to our micro SD card. If you haven't already, insert the micro SD card in your computer and launch Raspberry Pi Imager. Then, under Raspberry Pi device, click the button and you'll see a list of Pi models. In our case, we're interested in the Raspberry Pi 5, so select that option. Now we need to choose our operating system. Click the Choose OS button. In our case, we'll select Raspberry Pi OS 64-bit. However, under the Other General Purpose OS heading, you'll also find Ubuntu. If you're interested in seeing that, please let me know in the comments below. Next, we need to assign the storage device, which will be our micro SD card. I recommend disconnecting any other external storage devices except for your micro SD card at this point. You don't want to accidentally select the wrong drive, as it will completely replace what's on it with our selected operating system. From here, I'll select the 64GB micro SD card, then click the Next button. You'll then be prompted if you want to apply OS customization settings. We do, so we'll click the Edit Settings button. You'll see the checkbox is already enabled for configuring wireless LAN. You can enable this if you'd like and enter your Wi-Fi network name or SSID and password. If you have any other Raspberry Pis on your network with the host name of Raspberry Pi, you'll also want to click the checkbox for Set Host Name and change it to something different. I do have a Raspberry Pi 4 active on my network, so I'll change the host name here to Pi 5 Desktop. If you don't, no need to change this option. Additionally, you'll want to set the locale to your country and time zone. If you don't, you may have difficulty connecting over Wi-Fi. I've set mine to America Chicago. Everything is good at this point, so I'll click the Save button. With our settings applied, we can click the Yes button. Verify that the drive Pi Imager will be writing to is correct, and if so, click the Yes button. Pi Imager will now download and write the image directly to your micro SD card. This process will take a few minutes, so I'll go ahead and skip forward. The image creation is now complete. Click the Continue button and close out of Raspberry Pi Imager. Now you can safely eject your micro SD card from your computer. Moving back to the Pi 5, we can remove the micro SD card from our adapter. With the power off or red on the Pi 5, insert the micro SD card into the slot and press the power button. We'll now take a closer look at Pi OS Desktop. After powering on the Pi 5 with the Pi OS Desktop micro SD inserted, a welcome wizard will step you through getting everything ready. One thing I do want to point out before we begin, even though we set up the Wi-Fi and time zone settings prior to imaging Pi OS Desktop, the wizard still prompted me for this information. Anyway, just click the next button to get started. If prompted, select your time zone. I'll then select Use English Language and click Next. You'll then be prompted to enter a username and password for logging into the Pi. Enter the username you want to use and enter your password twice. Make sure you'll remember the password or write it down. Then click Next. If prompted for your Wi-Fi network, select yours from the list and click the Next button. Now enter your Wi-Fi password and again click Next. Select your preferred browser. I'll leave mine set for Chromium, but you may prefer Firefox. Make your selection and click Next. You'll now be asked if you want to update the software on the Pi. I highly recommend updating at this point, so we'll go ahead and click Next. This process will take several minutes, so I'll go ahead and skip forward. Now the system is up to date. Click the OK button. The Pi will then need to restart, so click the Restart button. Congratulations! At this point, your Pi 5 is all set up.
However, if you don't mind sticking around for a little bit longer, I'd like to show you a few more things. Oh yeah! You'll find a Wi-Fi icon in the upper right. Here you can check to make sure you're connected by clicking on it, or change it to a different Wi-Fi network if needed. To browse the internet, click the Chromium or Firefox icon if you installed that instead. The default page will open to raspberrypi.com, but of course you can open a new tab and visit anywhere you'd like, such as your new favorite website, wagnerstechtalk.com. One of the first things you're likely going to look for are some good productivity applications. To do that, you'll have to add them. For starters, you can click Preferences and select Recommended Software, then select Office and check the option for LibreOffice. If you're a developer, you may want to select Programming and download Visual Studio Code, which is an excellent code editor. After selecting what you want to install, click the Apply button and the applications will be downloaded and installed to your Pi 5. You may be prompted for the password that you entered earlier during installation. Then click the Raspberry icon and select Programming, and there you have Visual Studio Code. When PyOS Desktop first starts, the display resolution is 720p. If you'd like to change it, you can select Preferences, Screen Configuration, select the menu option Layout, Screens, and the display you want to change, Resolution, and the resolution you want to use, such as 1920 by 1080 or HD. The resolution will then switch to HD in this case. Note the gray bar at the bottom is from my video capture device which identifies the resolution and the refresh rate. Earlier we installed LibreOffice. If you select Office, you'll see six new Office applications that were installed. Calc is a spreadsheet application and a very good one at that. I'll enter a few numbers and go ahead and sum them up. And yeah, I definitely recommend giving LibreOffice a try. YouTube playback at 1080p is decent. With Stats for Nerds turned on, I did encounter some drop frames, but the playback was pretty smooth. There are likely further optimizations that can be done as PyOS continues to be enhanced. And just to let you know, I did stress the CPU to see if the fan and case would maintain a temperature below 80 degrees Celsius. That is, anything over 80 degrees would cause thermal throttling. At no point during my test did the temperature exceed 80 degrees and the fan was very quiet at around 26 decibels. However, the temperature was still sitting fairly close to 80 degrees, which is a bit of a concern. I suspect we'll see better cooling options from third-party companies in the future. If you're in need of a powerful graphics package, GIMP is one to consider. To install it, click the terminal icon and enter the command sudo apt install gimp. Follow the prompts to install it and from there you'll find it under graphics and you'll likely be impressed with its capabilities. It has a lot of features and I've just recently begun exploring what it can do. We've reached the end of another video. What we've seen today is just barely scratching the surface of what the Pi 5 can do. There is so much more I'd like to show you but it'll have to wait for another video. Hopefully you found in this video what you need to set up your Raspberry Pi 5 or help determine if it's something you're interested in. Comment below with your thoughts on the Raspberry Pi 5. If you found this video informative, please click the like button. It really does help with the YouTube algorithm. If you want to see more coverage of the Pi 5 in the future, please consider subscribing. And with that, I look forward to talking with you again very soon.